for inviting me. It's always great to, to be here. You know, I did my medical school here. I did my residency training program here, so it's always nice to uh, be here. Uh, my old friend Scott Nadler's plaque is still here, so it's always good to see that as well. So we're going to go through uh, some adipose, you know. Uh, we're going to turn something that's looked at so negatively, so common in our society with, you know, uh, obesity and see what we can do to make it positive, okay? Um, these are my disclosures. You guys probably know I have a couple of textbooks. Um, uh, I'm a consultant to this Biorestorative Therapies, which is a really interesting company. Uh, they've made a new type of bone marrow stem cell for uh, discogenic back pain. Um, I'm on the advisory board for another company called Tenanova, which is a device that uh, can debride uh, tendon tissue. Uh, and also a founder of a new company uh, called Data Biologics, which is a data uh, collection uh, organization. Um, I have a textbook on regenerative medicine. If, you're, if you get into it, it's, uh, it goes from the basics, just what, what are the words, the, the proper words to use, the nomenclature, things like that, techniques, uh, and an entire chapter on rehabilitation following these procedures, which is a neglected area within the whole area of uh, this regenerative uh, medicine. I um, always like to recall and remember my dear friend and co-editor, Victor Ibrahim, who tragically passed away a year ago at a very young age. So, I am the president of the Interventional Orthopedic Foundation. If you're at all interested in this or orthopedic type procedures, um, I encourage you to join. It's free for residents. Um, our annual meeting will be in Colorado on February 12th to 14. Um, we offer free scholarships for residents um, to attend the meeting, so you get to go to the meeting for free, and they pay a stipend for part of your flight and hotel, so it's kind of hard to beat. Okay, let's get to the crux of the matter. Is, uh, so you all know, because you see this every day uh, in your practices and in your rotations, but if you don't, musculoskeletal conditions are a big problem. It's the number two reason why people go see a doctor. Uh, major healthcare cost, 18% uh, of our all healthcare visits, lots of back pain, bone and joint, childhood injuries, uh, for arthritis and joint pain, estimation of 581 million, uh, billion rather, with this rapidly increasing over time. So the, um, this report from the United States Bone and Joint uh, Initiative, this came out in 2012. There is a recent one that came out in 2016. But in 2012, there were these statements within that that uh, really caught my eye. That talked about the trajectory we're choosing to accept prevalence and incidence of disorders with spiraling costs and less success in alleviating pain and suffering. And the time to act, this is in 2012, was now. And now we're seven years down the road, and we're still not really acting upon the, uh, what is going on. So what is going on? So in everyday orthopedic evaluations, either in primary care, many physiatry practices and certainly in orthopedic practices the evaluations are really fast so our visits are five minutes or so and you're going to try to get a really good history in five minutes do a physical examination in five minutes do a differential diagnosis in five minutes try to figure out what to do you probably don't do any of that stuff you get a really brief history hardly any physical examination or a lot of imaging studies and then have the imaging studies guide what happens knowing that imaging studies are fraught with false positives all the time we prescribe a lot of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Why? Well, when I was a resident in the 80s, because the drug reps took us out all the time and gave us really good meals and took us to bars and, and presented some sort of science that said, oh yeah, inflammation is driven by you know Cox, this Cox pathway and we need to block the Cox pathway. Uh, meanwhile, over time, NSAIDs, and, and then, we, then we developed the Cox 2 selectives. They were going to really be great because we we're going to eliminate all the GI problems really be selective and solve all that. And then people die of heart attacks and strokes. And now there isn't a safe NSAID, right? But, you know, it was Vioxx that was the big bad one. And then everyone subsequently since, and even the over-the-counter, their black box warning on all NSAIDs. Uh, we do perfunctory physical therapy, right? Say, all right, refer to PT. I think physical medicine rehabilitation specialists at least understand and are more precise in our, 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 um, our prescriptions. But not always. Uh, what goes on in physical therapy is a big black box. It's often modality-based, not evidence-based. When that fails, when people come back and have pain, they get corticosteroid injections, often illogically, because most patients don't have an inflammatory process. Corticosteroids are known to be toxic to articular cartilage, known to be toxic to tenocytes, known to be no better than uh, a bunch of other things, and known to be harmful. And then when all that fails, 
the patient has failed quote unquote non-operative treatment and so they have surgery. And so surgery is going to save the day, but often does not. So if we look at, and this area of regenerative treatments or orthobiologics is really scrutinized by the academicians and orthopedic surgeon community, community as not being evidence-based. So orthopedic surgery must be evidence-based, but when you look at the literature on orthopedic surgery, only 20% of all the orthopedic surgical procedures that are done commonly are supported by at least one low-risk randomized control study. And we know there are a lot of really interesting, and as a sports person, I'm interested in these sports injuries, so meniscal tears, chondral lesions that occur, and rotator cuff tears. And these occur in everyday population and in high-level athletes. But uh, certainly, partial meniscectomy for degenerate meniscal tears really should be an abandoned procedure because the literature, especially over the last four to five years, has totally found a lack of efficacy, found that this procedure is no better than physical therapy, no better than a sham surgery. And basically, when you look at orthopedic literature and, and the thought leaders within the orthopedic uh, community, there's great concerns over whether this procedure should be continued or not. And yet, it is the number one outpatient procedure in America. 700,000 partial meniscectomies on an annual basis. Um, with, you know, statements that would suggest that there is no benefit and, in fact, is associated with harms. We know that when you resect a, men a meniscus, you change the loads within a knee joint and you accelerate underlying degenerative arthritis. Um, and the fact is that uh, somebody that's had a knee arth arthroscopic surgery, partial meniscectomy, has a three times risk of requiring total knee arthroplasty. And this just came out you know, just a couple of years ago in a clinical journal of sports medicine, that practitioners should discontinue this pattern of clinical care unless we have something um, more robust to show that it is improved and that there's a pressing need to see whether there's any evidence of efficacy or a place for this procedure. Now, okay, everyday schmoes, but our NFL athletes, right, our high-level athletes, we really ought to be using techniques to get them back on the field, back on the field quickly, continuing their career. What happens in the NFL athlete? Now you're talking about 20 to 25 year old elite athletes. I mean, these folks can do unbelievable things if you ever watch an NFL football game. So this was just one study that looked at 72 patients who underwent partial meniscectomy. Only 61% were able to return to play the previous level of competition. It took them eight and a half months a couple of years later, only 40% of those guys were still in the NFL. If you talk about your speed positions, or really elite type of positions, running backs, receivers, linebackers, they were four times less likely to return to play than your non-speed, like your lineman and your tight end, who could probably tolerate you know, moving around on a pretty creaky kind of a knee. And as far as looking at chondral injuries, so chondroplasty or microfracture procedures, again, there's only a 67% capability of returning to the regular season game, and only 24% of those folks were still active in the NFL a couple of years later. People that got microfracture were four and a half times less likely to return to the NFL. They played less games, less seasons, and played less games per season. So it doesn't seem like for the able body, uh, I mean for the general population, nor for the elite athlete, that these procedures are very robust. Um, Paul Chicharella and a few other residents, we got together and we put together this review topic. Um, if you're interested in the meniscus, this is a review from the anatomy, biomechanics, microanatomy, current treatments, and future, future treatments. But obviously, when you have this disparity of what we have to offer and the outcomes, we have what's referred to in the um, osteoarthritis world as a treatment gap. The gap where you've exhausted non-operative treatment and then the time for needing surgical intervention. And in osteoarthritis, people can sit in this osteoarthritis treatment gap anywhere from 10 to 20 years. Um, so <clears throat> why consider uh, the cellular or what's called stem cell? I think it's probably best to refer to them as cellular procedures because the word stem cell is used very loosely and has strict criteria. Well, there's a lot of reasons, and these are just a bunch of different things <coughs> listed here on top of the things I've already talked about. All right, we'll talk about long bone defects, osteonecrosis, meniscal tears, uh, volumetric muscle loss, which is a big problem in the military population, rotator cuff injuries, 
and intervertebral disc disorders. Um, in the literature, then, if you're going to go into these cellular procedures, there's been a debate uh, whether what is the preferred cell type, bone marrow versus adipose. For years, people have talked about how bone marrow is the preferred source, and that adipose really, really had no place in orthopedics. It was good for plastic surgery, tissue filling, uh, for uh, wound care, but really didn't have a place in orthopedic literature. And it was because of that that we didn't do uh, uh, any procedures using adipose until 2015. We were only a bone marrow um, uh, type of practice. And some of it was, if you looked at the literature, look at the literature uh, regarding this, people that were proponents of adipose, even back when, would talk about the numbers of nucleated cells, which is a surrogate for the number of potential stem cells, as being way superior pound for pound. And that's where the adipose world was until about 2012. So, but from 2012 to the present, the amount of literature and the, res uh, the research to support adipose as the source of cells has greatly increased. And we've gone from bone marrow being a superior source to maybe equal to adipose to some people saying adipose might be the superior source for orthopedic conditions. And we'll talk about why that might be. The problem with adipose is that the FDA is very concerned about what happens with adipose tissue and has guidance that would su suggest that you can use adipose tissue only if you use what's referred to as minimal manipulation. You can't alter the intrinsic properties of the adipose tissue, you can't use enzymatic digestion, and thus you can't create something called stromovascular fraction, which is commonly used in places outside of the United States um, and used in the United States but not with FDA guidance. So if you looked at an infographic or information regarding, all right, I want to know what's going on, clinical trials, this is 2011, you really can find a whole lot of other disorders, but you really don't see anything that would be an orthopedic type of condition. And once again, we would see that literature, we'd see the FDA guidance regarding adipose, and we would not be interested in adipose. And then this is another one looking at the published data as of uh, May 5th of 2012, and boy, what's the evidence for me to suggest adipose tissue to a patient when I have this type of uh, infographic. Chris Centeno and the folks in Regenix are a predominantly <coughs> bone marrow only group. They've produced a variety of articles of mixed evidence, but frankly not the greatest literature. They collect a lot of data, so they have a registry, they collect a lot of data, and they're very adamant that bone marrow is the source for orthopedic conditions. And these were the infographics that were produced <coughs> regarding the number of bone marrow stem cell therapies versus fat stem cell therapies, and the published research or FDA trials related to uh, various orthopedic conditions. But fortunately, over the last five to ten years now, adipose tissue has greatly increased. There's been a great interest in it. The basic scientists have helped. The translational scientists have helped. Uh, this is just one article that reviews the variety of different cell procedures for osteoarthritis in a meta-analysis showing that, you know, while a lot of people will uh, talk negatively about the level of quality of this research, it's a relatively uh, reasonable good research. Um, and in this research, it has a variety of both adipose and bone marrow type studies that have looked at it. This is just yet another meta-analysis looking at 11 trials, 582 knees, this is for osteoarthritis of the knee. Uh, again, almost entirely showing a favorable uh, outcome measure and a great safety profile for um, bone marrow stem cell therapies and a variety of mesenchymal stem cell therapies for knee osteoarthritis. Uh, this came out just a year ago, so this was in the American Journal of Sports Medicine, and basically outlined whatever literature they had up until that time. So did a comprehensive review, Bedline Search, Cochrane Library, and so you can see the, the variety of different numbers with a variety of number of patients, with a variety of different joints treated, with a variety of different cell sources, mostly uh, bone marrow and adipose tissue, with a variety of different outcome measures. If you try to summarize this, uh, basically the systematic review would suggest that these uh, treatments are safe and show a progression toward improvement and, and uh, promise, but without definitive, none of them will say definitively that these uh, treatments are helpful. Um, the only randomized control study using bone marrow actually found that bone marrow was no better than saline. 
So this was a study by Shane Shapiro, who's a good friend. He's down at Mayo Jacksonville. He thought of a really unique design where he would take people with bilateral knee pain and they would be their own control. So one knee got saline, one knee got a very uh, precise bone marrow treatment, and what did they find? It was no better. Saline uh, was as good as bone marrow. Now, you could try to suggest, although the journal, the American Journal of Sports Medicine, summarily declined to say that maybe the bone marrow knee felt better and they were able to load the opposite knee better. Maybe the bone marrow has systemic effects, which is actually true, and help to reduce the inflammatory nature of the opposite knee as well as the, um, as well as the knee that got injected with the active ingredient. Otherwise, you would say we ought to all be using saline injections, right? <laughs> as a simple treatment. Um, and, you know, there's been some blogging that an orthopedic surgeon kind of talked about this study and talked about how we got to stop using these treatments. And I said, because it's no better than saline, I said, oh, well, are you injecting saline then in your patients? And he said, no, I don't inject placebo. All right. But, in fact, in American Journal of Sports Medicine, there's been a meta-analysis that's been performed on the effectiveness of normal saline. And if you look at it on a pure p-value basis, it is effective, but I don't think a minimally clinical significant difference of 1.3. So if you start with a 6, you go to a 4.7. That's not gratifying to me as a clinician. And if I'm a patient, I want a little bit more than that, right? So I don't think that Shapiro's um, article, which showed significant benefits, and these folks really improved greatly, would uh, entice us to start injecting saline, um, but it, then it's also hard to say that bone marrow is the slam dunk treatment as well. But it does open up whether there's some interest uh, in the bone marrow side. Um, and then this is just that same normal saline article looking at both VAST and Womax scales, both of them meeting MCIDs for those measures. Um, there, this article in JBDS in 2014, I, I put this in here because it's a bone marrow study. It got massive fanfare, but it really wasn't a great study. It was 55 patients that had partial meniscectomy. So they decided to harm the patient by taking out part of their meniscus and then say, well, what can we do to help these poor people out? Well, what they did was they took allogenic bone marrow. So they took bone marrow cells from 30-year-old um, uh, people that donated their, their bone marrow and got their knees injected. There were three levels. There was a five, uh, 50 uh, billion, 150 billion, and the control was hyaluronic acid. And what they noted was that there was improvement in meniscal in pain and improvement in meniscal volume. Uh, but the interesting thing is that the middle dose or the lower dose actually did better than the higher dose. So different from the normal human mentality, the American mentality, that more is better. More is not necessarily better. And that also talks, that also is true in, uh, for PRP as well, especially PRP for tendon problems. More is not necessarily better. But in two years, there were statistically significant differences between the HA group and, uh, sorry, HA folks, um, and the, uh, and the allo, uh, allogenic bone marrow. With, you know, meager improvements, right, in my mind, but there was improvement in meniscal volume of about 24% at 12 months and 18% at two years. So um, about five years ago in 2015, we got introduced to a product that made what looked like and still is a FDA compliant uh, way of obtaining adipose tissue and using it. And it was presented, uh, a Polish orthopedic surgeon presented his first 100 patients with some amazing repeat MRI. So, between that, um, I was sitting at the table with Arnold Kaplan, who's felt to be the godfather of stem cells, who said, I think this is probably a really good way to go. Um, and we got to know the developer. So we went down this path of adipose tissue. So what is in adipose tissue that makes it attractive? Well, there's a, a, bare, a variety of cellular components uh, that signal, and there's a variety of other things that help to signal. Uh, and so it's more the signaling things that are released from the stem cells, if you will, or the cellular components or the pericytes, which are um, around blood vessels, than perhaps just the cells themselves. So in looking at this, again, trying to figure out, should we stay on the path of bone marrow or should we go toward adipose? There's been some interesting studies to compare. So this was 
a group of patients that were going to get their hip replaced. Um, and uh, Before they got their hip replaced, uh, each patient, there was five patients, they had a bone marrow aspiration and they had an adipose tissue aspiration. And then their bone, um, their hip joint explant was exposed to both of these types of cells to see what the chondrocytes would do in that environment. Pretty interesting, unique studies. What they found was the ASCs had what they referred to as a younger phenotype, which allowed for more proliferation of the chondrocytes. Uh, and it demonstrated an enhancement in the proliferative capacity that's similar to the, to the same donor. So that at the end of it, the conclusion was that the adipose derived stem cells may be the preferred cell source for musculoskeletal conditions. There's yet another study, this just came out this past year, that looked at, again, exposing uh, same donor, so people that had uh, aspiration of bone marrow, people that had aspiration of adipose uh, stem cells, and then exposing various cellular uh, tissues to those, um, to those cells. Um, and they also reviewed the literature that, sh that talks about how there's a lot of studies now in clinical trials for both adipose and for bone marrow, but they're getting pretty close. But what they found was, and, and they looked at this tissue in, in a lot of microassays and a lot of really detailed chemistry beyond what I want to get into today. But what they found was that the adipose derived stem cells were more controllable, more able to survive a hypoxic articular cavity. So when you take cells, the thing you have to remember is that when you inject them into, let's say, an arthritic knee or an inflamed knee, that's a very hostile environment for those cells. So they have to be able to survive. There's this concept of preconditioning, maybe having those cells be conditioned into a harsh environment before you inject it, but that is not FDA compliant unless you start going down a route of IND. We recently put this out, so myself and a couple of residents gathered all the studies and made this infographic. So if you go to our website, you can get this infographic that looks at microfragmented adipose tissue, stromovascular cells, or adipose-derived stem cells by year, and then you can toggle over this and it'll take you directly to the article itself, so if you want to see what the article itself says. But you can see there's a lot of literature now that has been compiled over the last decade or so. Um, so in terms of clinical studies then, uh, this is a study that started a, a German-French kind of co-op uh, kind of project, 18 patients with severe osteoarthritis, a dose escalation from uh, 2 billion all the way to 50 billion cells. Uh, patients treated with the low dose actually had significant improvements as well as the higher dose, and that the conclusions were this intracurricular injection of ASCs is safe and an alternative for patients suffering from severe osteoarthritis. This Hoichin study is a very nice study because it looks at pain, function, histology, imaging studies, and uh, repeat arthroscopy in a small group, of, in, a, in a subgroup of this population. So this looked at 18 patients injected into their knee with adipose-derived stem cells, no adverse response, the size of the articular cartilage well, uh, um, decreased while the volume of cartilage increased in the medial femoral and tibial condyles in the higher dose group in this study. Arthroscopy showed that there was a decrease in defects in the medial femoral head and tibial condyle, and that when they biopsy these, these, um, these areas, they were thick, hyaline-like cartilage. When you do microfracture, you create something that looks like cartilage, but at the end of the day, it's not hyaline cartilage, it's fibrocartilage. And they were able to do this in different dose groups and showing over time how you can get resolution of these bone marrow lesions over time, how you get changes in the uh, content of the medial and lateral femoral condyle, and you can get improvement in what these large defects look over time in low dose, but particularly in the high dose group. So large lesions that now look pretty well healed over. So the results were that you know improved function, improved pain, no adverse response, you reduce cartilage defects, and you regenerated hyaline-like cartilage. Um, Co has done a few different studies. So his first study combined arthroscopic lavage in 30 elderly patients and used stromovascular fraction. That's the fraction that you get after you take raw fat and you enzymatically digest it after liposuction. And they had a variety of cells, but about 4 billion cells were injected. They looked at Coos, VAS, Lysium, and 16 of those patients underwent a second local arthroscopy. So about half of them had a second local arthroscopy. Two-year follow-up uh, basically showed same levels of improvement as they did it at 12 months. So this was sustained over a two-year time frame. Elderly patients greater than 65, only two had, oh, I'm sorry, only five had a demonstrated worsening. On second look at arthroscopy, 88% had improved 
or maintained articular cartilage two years later. None of the patients went on over the two-year time frame to, uh, to require total knee arthroplasty. And again, these are the, the KU scores showing, these KU scores and showing improvements at three months, 12 months, and two years. So all sustained, in fact, gradually improving even over time. And these large defects now much improved. Not perfect, but much improved. Um, this was a multi-center Eastern European study where they looked at over 1,100 patients, uh, mostly hip and knees. This also used stromovascular fraction. They looked at 1,800 joints, and 1,100 were followed for anywhere from 12 to 54 months, on average about a year and a half for safety and efficacy. No serious side effects, no systemic infection, no cancers, gradual improvement, usually started around two to three months and continued to 12 months. If you looked at something you want to talk to patients, so you say to your patient, 75% improvement will occur in about 63% of patients, at least 50% improved in over 90%. Patients that were obese and had worse arthritis had improvement but took much longer time. So yet another study, 20 patients with osteoarthritis, this is autologous concentrated adipose tissue. This was a centrifugation and lipoaspirate, so this was not stromovascular fraction. They looked at VAS and Womax scales, and they also looked at some serology testing. Um, there was a significant improvement in pain and function in all these different patients, uh, improvement in the chondrogenic stimulation, um, and they also noted that there was a presence of a newly formed tissue on uh, staining and on um, electron microscopy beginning at the bone side of the chondral lesion. Finally, just uh, a year ago as well, this is a rotator cuff uh, tear study. Again, a dose escalation study. 20 patients with a, a rotator cuff tear uh, that were injected intratendinously on uh, ultrasound guidance. The outcomes included clinical outcomes, so pain and spady scores, radiologic appearance, uh, MRI, and a repeat arthroscopy. So as far as safety, there were no adverse responses. The speedy scores increased by 80 to uh, 77 to 80%, depending on whether you're in the mid or higher dose group. Uh, the pain was significantly reduced by 71%. On MRI, the volume of the bursal cited defects decreased by 90% in the higher dose group. Um, and on arthroscopic examination, there were decreases in the bursal and articular cited defects by anywhere from 80 to 90%. Um, and again, these are the various uh, scale scores, uh, the speedy, the constant score, and their VAS scores that improved over time in all groups. And then these are the repeat arthroscopy showing improvement, especially on the reversal side of tear um, in the high dose group. But, but we have to be careful with adipose, especially with the FDA. And so the FDA came out with guidance several years ago that talked about what can be done, and you cannot do this in the United States. Um, otherwise, in the United States, it's considered a drug. So, human tissue products um, are controlled under what was referred to as the uh, 361, meaning that if they meet all four of these criteria, minimum manipulation, used homologously, not combined with anything else, not used for its systemic effect, is considered a 361 and can be used. Otherwise, it's a 351, and that makes it a drug. Uh, minimal manipula manipulation means that it does not alter the original relevant characteristics of tissue. So in the FDI, the FDA eyes, if you take adipose tissue, you enzymatically digest it, you've changed the tissue, you've disrupted the tissue. Um, the tissue characteristic is, as it's original in a donor, um, it's utilized for reconstructive repair or replacement. Uh, things such as cutting, grinding, washing are all, all allowed under minimal manipulation. Um, so what is all that? You know, you have this teeter-totter of what uh, you can do versus, you know, what is allowed. Uh, so if you have, there's pros and cons of both, right? Um, you, you do get more cells and you do get some uh, other things when you do SVF, uh, but you, it comes at a higher cost and uh, more time. So in 2015, this company called Lipogens, and I am a, a consultant for that company, I do some teaching for that company, came out with this closed loop, closed loop device that's autologous, no centrifugation. It microfractures the adipose tissue into these clusters. Uh, it reaches minimal manipulation. Uh, there's no enzymatic digestion. This is how the device looks like on a schema. Uh, there's a wash bag. The raw fat gets put into this device. It gets 
broken down. There's the uh, uh, stainless steel balls to help to gently break up the adipose tissue. The waste products go into this bag. So blood, oil, uh, adventitial tissue, that all gets washed out. And then you're left with uh, a tissue that's injectable even uh, with a 27 gauge when they use it in plastic surgery. For our, our, our uses, we're usually using 18 gauge to get into tissues. So there really wasn't any literature though in 2015 when we first started using it. This was the first little bit of a case report looking at assisting a chondral lesion in the retropatellar area after arthroscopic surgery that showed benefit. Uh, then finally, a couple of years ago, there was more and more, 17 patients in this uh, knee arthritis <coughs> patient, 32, 32 knees, with a decrease in, in VAS by about 50%, with an increasing look, uh, interesting look at the glycosaminoglycan content in the hyaline cartilage without adverse response. So they, they traced what the hyaline cartilage looked like before and after to show improvement in glycosaminoglycans after treatment. A retrospective study of 40 patients looked at the same type of tissue, intraarticular injection during arthroscopic procedure. Um, they looked at a variety of functional scales as well as pain scales. They felt that if you had at least 10 points in these scales, that was a cutoff for success. So that was their uh, success cutoff. Uh, as far as complications, there were none. Uh, There's a total median improvement in 20 patients in terms of their IKDC as well as their total coups. Higher percentage of patients had improvement in their VAS and lysome. The median improvement was 24 points, so their cutoff was 10. They got to 24, so they doubled the amount of improvement. Their tension knee scores improved by a factor, three times that factor of 31 points. Um, yet another study looking at 38 patients, <coughs> arthroscopic procedure injected. So some of the orthopedic literature is confounded by having arthro orthopedic procedures because orthopedic surgeons like doing arthroscopic surgery. But uh, enhancing the uh, benefits or maybe minimizing the harmful, harmful effects of arthroscopy are shown in these studies. So 92% of patients clinically improved and 100% of them were satisfied without adverse response. This is a study that looked at arthroscopic procedures and some group just got a little clean out, some group actually got partial meniscectomy. So I, I want to point your attention to while both groups did pretty well, this partial meniscectomy group, because they did something, uh, did worse at two years. If they just let the poor people alone, they would have continued to have done better. So this is a difference between both groups getting the microfragmented adipose tissue, but one group actually having meniscal surgery superimposed upon it. Uh, a three-year follow-up study, again, shows continued improvement. So, you know, if this thing only lasts like three months or six months or even a year, is it worth it given the price? Uh, this showed continued improvement over a three-year period in this, a group of 30 in three years. This just came out just last month. This was a Danish study. So a lot of the lipogens literature is uh, Italian, European, because that's where the company came from. So this was an independent Danish study that showed who's at three, six, and 12 months. Um, and basically the only complication was a cosmetic change to the abdominal subcutaneous tissue in one patient. So there probably was some dimpling, and that is a potential. Um, but their conclusions were that intraarticular injections of this microfragmented tissue is a, a reasonable treatment option that is safe. Uh, they just pretty much looked at safety. We published this uh, a couple of years ago in the Journal of Orthopedic Spine Sports, 18 patients with severe shoulder OA. Um, their pain scales went from a 7.5 to a 3.6. Their ASES, uh, shoulder and elbow scores, uh, basically doubled without any post-procedural complications. This group was that bad shoulder OA in about uh, 65 to 70 year olds, so an older group with bad shoulder OA. So in PMNR, uh, we were asked to do a point counterpoint. Uh, Joanne Borgstein and her fellow uh, took the side of bone marrow stem cells, myself and Sam Dona, who was a uh, Atlantic Health uh, Sports Fellow, we took the side of uh, adipose-derived uh, stromal cells in this treatment of a theoretical 55-year-old female with knee OA who had exhausted non-operative treatment. So that article, if you get it, will review the rationale for both sides uh, and obviously clearly will show that the adipose side won because myself and Dr. John did that <laughs> side. <laughs> Uh, my former fellow, Sean Bomanian, and I, we did a review of microfragmented adipose tissue in NEOA. And again, it's a review article for your reference that you can easily get. I think this is uh, free access. And basically showed uh, clear safety and potential effectiveness in NEOA and uh, other orthopedic conditions. 
Um, my friend Ken Mountner took a series of patients that he had that compared bone marrow patients that he did and compared adipose and wanted to see, okay, how did those two groups do over time? Um, which is the superior source, bone marrow, which he had done, and then this new adipose tissue. So it was a prospective study uh, over time. Uh, all patients had six months of follow-up. He did various functional scales. Um, 110 patients, uh, 76 with follow-up data, 35 in the microfragmented, 41 in the uh, bone marrow aspirate. Uh, a little bit more follow-up in the bone marrow aspirate group because he had been doing that a little bit longer. But what did he find? Basically no difference. They, they both groups improved significantly, but no significant differences between your microfragmented adipose tissue versus your bone marrow tissue. Uh, no changes in, in their various Ku scales as well. No differences, although both groups did very, very well with very significant p-values in terms of pre and post treatment. Uh, in terms of uh, responders, uh, at least 25% improvement is your responder. Those that had lower grades of arthritis, KL1s and KL2s, did extraordinarily well. Uh, people that had severe arthritis did reasonably well. I mean, 55%, 50% improvement is a reasonable level of improvement for that severity of arthritis and for as minimally invasive as this procedure is. So the conclusions were that there are significant uh, improvements in pain infection whether you use microfragmented adipose tissue or bone marrow uh, for over one year without significant differences between these modalities and without significant adverse responses. This is what the holy grail of what you hope. So you take this close to bone on bone. Everybody that I see, their orthopedic surgeon tells them they're bone on bone, even if they have this joint space. But this is a nice change in bone, uh, jo joint space. Uh, we've collected data going back to 2016. Actually, this is an IRB uh, approved uh, data registry. Uh, we've looked at knee, hip, shoulder, elbow for a variety of the various uh, treatments. We looked at our microfragmented folks. Uh, you know, some groups did extraordinarily well, 83. Some groups, the hip still did very weak, and so we're trying to find ways to improve on that. As far as uh, uh, side effects or adverse effects, we had one case of a localized cellulitis that treated treated with oral antibiotics, a few uh, bad breeze, uh, bruises, and one with a hematoma. Otherwise, this was a very safe, and, and when you do this procedure, you have to have outcomes both on the site of where you're harvesting as well as the site that you're treating. So, procedure safe, clearly based on this database, and significant benefits continue or occur three months and basically continue onward. Um, we did then uh, an IRB approved study looking at degenerative meniscal tear. This was uh, Reina Nakamura did a case report that she presented to AMSSN, the very first patient who was a female triathlete who really didn't have a lot of fat. So the big problem with her is getting fat, but she had a degenerative meniscal tear of the posterior horn of a medial meniscus along with a chondral lesion at the retropatellar region. Uh, arthroscopic partial meniscectomy was recommended. She declined to proceed with that. She was not interested in that. Uh, so we did the procedure. Three months later, she did extraordinarily well in terms of her coups, in terms of her merit pain scale, but also improved in terms of her ability to return as a triathlete racing and participating in a variety of events. We've completed this study uh, of meniscal tears in 35-year-olds, failed conservative treatment. We're told that they needed to have arthroscopic partial meniscectomy. This is the exclusion criteria. These were 60-year-olds, BMIs, you know, up there, equal male, female. Uh, we looked at them as far as 24 months. Their initial coups were 56, which is pretty limited, and their pain scale was about five and a half. And so this is what we saw over time, that we were able to reduce their VAS by a factor of 3.2, not the meager 1.4 MCID, right, with high p-values throughout all the pain as well as the coups subscales. Uh, much better if you compare these to what is seen with partial meniscectomy. And this is just a graphic representation of what occurs. Generally, the fastest changes occur between one and three months, and then things stabilize and then continue over time. Um, we also, Jay Paschal and I helped uh, an orthopedic surgeon out of Chicago, uh, Ms. Scheinkoff, review severe osteoarthritic patients age 72. So they had grade three, four, median age of 72, 17 subjects that were injected with significant improvement in their pain scores and the KSSS scores that sort of decayed after the six month mark, but were pretty remarkable even at 12 months, even though not as good at six months. Um, and these were the functional improvement scales that occurred over time, 
And so in this severe osteoarthritic group using this treatment, it was profoundly helpful. Uh, so we now have additional studies that we're working on. So we now have um, a DOD study, a Department of Defense, about $500,000, randomized control study looking at the uh, meniscal tears in the military. Uh, we have a chronic shoulder pain study that we completed, a pilot study. We did our first 10 subjects that will be done in one year. Now we have an RTC for that. Um, and then we have uh, a few other studies. This was a study, again, with this guy, Striano, in upstate New York, looking at severe NEOA, uh, again, older age population, uh, BMIs of 31, and followed them over time. And they had this rapid improvement at one month that was continued over time with this tremendous p-value in both their pain and coup scores. There was a subset of group I saw in this patient population that intrigued me. There was about six patients who rated their knee pain bilaterally as 10 over 10. I've never had, I, 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 I don't think you can walk if you have that. I don't think you can breathe if you have that. So um, that seemed like a different group. So I said, well, why don't we just look at the normal people taking this, these guys out? Uh, so if we exclude those people, their values did even, there was more significant improvement in terms of what happens. Now, whether that's legit or not is another story we can talk about, but um, and then this is the rotator cuff tear study that we did together looking at these improvements. We are now working with Kessler Foundation, so I said we've done 10 subjects now with rotator cuff tears in wheelchair population which are independent. They've done extraordinarily well. This is one of the first posters that we presented. Uh, we are following them with serial ultrasound and then we have several that have had serial MRIs. So we have a serial MRI uh, on a, a few of those that we'll be publishing to see what changes. We now have a $550,000 grant from the New Jersey Commission to now do a randomized control study on this uh, patient population with Trevor Dyson, who's a researcher from Kessler. This is the uh, pre and post MRI, this pilot study on serial MRI, and we've done, uh, Nathan Hobelboom, who's my PhD person, has done a refined way of looking at the volume of the, uh, of the tendon, and there's significant improvement in tendon volume. Uh, we are also now going to be starting a partial rotator cuff tear study with this company called Ingeneron that has a new method of using adipose tissues. There will be 20 centers throughout the United States. We'll be one of those study sites. There will be 246. Uh, so we'll be start recruiting for that. And then we have this military study that we'll be recruiting in January as well. A randomized control study injection of microfragmented adipose tissue using a technique called trephination. Uh, one group just gets trephination, the other group gets trephination plus microfragmented adipose tissue. So, um, what can we say? We know that musculoskeletal conditions are a large burden on our healthcare system, that uh, our current state of treatment uh, demonstrates questionable benefits, whether it's on the non operative side or the operative side. Uh, various biologic treatments, including PRP and cellular treatments, have shown increasing evidence of efficacy for a variety of these conditions. Historically, bone marrow was the preferred tissue for orthopedic conditions, but clearly now adipose is at least as good and maybe, uh, maybe superior. Uh, so there's increasing evidence for the use of adipose tissue, and I think adipose in certain situations where you need to fill tissue defects, right? So you have a meniscal tear, there's a tissue defect. You have a rotator cuff tissue defect, you put adipose tissue, the adipose acts as a scaffold filler of that defect, as well as having this bioactive uh, release of substances that enhanced tissue healing. Uh, you have to be compliant with the FDA if you're going to do any of these things. And obviously, we need to all collect data. So anybody that's involved in this needs to be involved in the data registry. And that's why I started this company called um, Data Biologics. So I encourage you to think about this at the, very, at the very least. Think about what you do every day and make sure that you're not doing things that are not so good for patients. So don't prescribe NSAIDs so much. Don't do too many corticosteroid injections. Maybe mm -hmm. one, hold your nose and do it, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's it. Um, and then think about things that are more enhancing of people's inherent uh, capabilities of healing versus getting in the way of that or causing a problem or a complication. Um, this was something I saw in USA Today. There were two brothers in uh, Virginia, uh, Milton and Norman Endy, who were using adipose stem cell therapies in the 1960s. So we think we're so cutting edge, innovative. As far as I know, 1960s was 60 years ago. That's it. So I look forward to hearing your thoughts.
questions, concerns? We'll, we'll open up to questions for Dr. Malina. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I think this was an awesome presentation, and it really, uh, like the gems, definitely has potential. Now, the um, any uh, you mentioned something about spine earlier. Uh, have there has there been any use of the ad, um, you know, uh, either lipo gems or other adipose in the yeah. um, arena of discogenic uh, pain? And the same principles of avoiding corticosteroids in the epidural space um, yeah. and and joints uh, yeah. would also apply. I would for sure. I mean, listen, um, I have an entire it's a 160 slide talk on new paradigms in the treatment of orthopedic condition that goes over all the flaws of what we do, all the flaws of NSAIDs and the negative effects. All, and you know, corticosteroid steroids were developed by Kendall and Hench back in 1939. They won the Nobel Prize of Medicine at Mayo Clinic. So I spent four years at Mayo Clinic, so I'm always kind of trying to find the Mayo Clinic, kind of, and there's a, there's a building called the, uh, the uh, Kendall Building at Mayo Clinic. But when they first came up with this ability to, to synthesize cortisone, and it took them a long time, and they called it compound F, and that's what we used to call it when we would inject it at Mayo Clinic. They went through A, B, C, and they failed, failed, failed. Um, they injected people that were bedridden from severe uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And those people got out of their beds, and they took showers for the first time. A couple of people began to dance for the first time. But even then, they warned about the indiscriminate use of steroids. They said, you've got to be careful about this stuff. And you know, 70 years later, I would say, between Medrol dose packs, between NSAIDs, and between corticosteroid injections, there's an indiscriminate use of those products that makes no sense and is harmful to human beings. So we have at least 16,000 deaths from NSAIDs, but probably more in the realm of 60,000 deaths from NSAIDs. And so that's a problem, right? And we know, and several years ago, we had tainted corticosteroids that were injected in the epidural space that basically killed people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you, your point is well taken. We need to use all of these things very strategically. Spinal injection procedures are a failed experiment for the most part, right? I grew up when these things first started happening, right? I grew up when the Saul brothers first int introduced mm -hmm. transferaminal epidural injections, and they showed how there was a reduction in, in prostaglandins, and it was going to be, that was in 1992. So that's like how many years ago now? 25 years ago, right? We have more surgeries, more people on disability from back pain, more people on opiates, more people dying from opiates than ever. So if that was going to save things, it should have saved something by now. It hasn't. <coughs> so if you selectively use it, I think selective use combined with other better things is the way to go. Yeah. So lipogens, there's a guy, there's a surgeon, spine surgeon in uh, Atlanta who's been applying it inter, uh, interdiscally and in facet joints. Some reasonable stuff. Too early. And, and one last comment you mentioned on the knee study with the saline placebo that perhaps there was a systemic effect benefiting the other knee. Yeah. Could be, but you might not want to say that too loud since the FDA would put the kibosh on it. If that correct, did, correct. Did, because they ridiculous. don't want it to work as a systemic yeah. thing. So the FDA likes to box everything in these neat boxes, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, they got in big trouble because they categorized the breast and breast reconstruction uh, that the breast was the sole purpose of a breast was to was for lactation. And so if you had breast tissue for anything else other than lactation, and they got slammed, they had to pull back and all that stuff because so they don't really sometimes the nuances get lost. It's all right, what else? Yes, sir. So just uh, as I'm sure everyone here very interested in regenerative. I think I started learning about it like two, three years ago. Um, and what I'm trying to figure out is a lot of us are kind of confined by conventional practice, just patients can't afford it, etc. And I'm trying to develop, as I'm going to be going into my own practice, I'm, I'm uh, currently with uh, Dr. Borchan at the moment doing yeah. this innovative thing. I'm trying to figure out the patients with acute um, herniated discs, severe pain, or um, maybe acute meniscal tear, 
um, without locking. Uh, well, dextrose is the those, cheapest stuff you could find. Like and those kind of patients get steroid. I mean, I guess why? More willingly. Why are you give them steroid? So what would you? You're, do? What, what is the first premise of a doctor? No harm. First, do no harm. A corticosteroid is something that is a good thing for a patient. So what do you do for a patient who's debilitating back pain from particular... Well, there's a million things to do. That's like, you're, you're talking like the orthopedic surgeons when I told them that they should not inject corticosteroids for chronic lateral epicondylosis. They are like, whoa, 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 what are we going to do? You're paralyzed. All they had was that. That's all they got. You're a physiatrist. You've got a million things you can do. Well, I mean, okay, sorry, I'm leaving some out. They're, they're failing conservative management. Okay. In other words, they can't do you know John Sarno at all? You ever heard of John Sarno? Mm -hmm. You ever read John Sarno's book? No, Mind Over Back. Yeah. Should be mandatory reading. Mm -hmm. You ever read The House of God? You ever read that book? No, you gotta read That's mandatory reading. <laughs> House of God, The Citadel, and Mind Over Back. If you're a physiatrist, you should read Mind Over Back. If you're really interested, in how mm, reality and disease, you should either YouTube, Google, audiobook, Bruce Lipton's book, uh, Biology of Belief. So you combine those th two things, those four things, and I would bet you that you, you'd come back saying, I got a lot I can do besides giving them poisons and injecting them with poisons. Yes, Reese. See, now, this is now the mid middle. I, I respect his question in a sense. What? We're as all a, doing it. So as I'm a, trying a, a, to, oh, yeah, well, listen. Practice, how do I build it, in it, this? It, don't from don't do stuff because everybody else is doing it. Right? That's what my teenage son will, do, will yeah. say when he comes back after he gets pulled over for drunk driving. <clears throat> they were all doing it. Don't do it. It's going to be hard. It, it'll be hard. You'll be going against the grain. But, so what? Yeah. What, what my comment is this, is that now I'm seeing, you know, about 12 years in, uh, very, very high volume in that work, demographic, you know, in that with Medicare, Jersey City. Then I open something in Manhattan County. The reality is the reality. If I say to a patient, that I'm going to give you this, and it's going to help you. The, 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 the problem becomes, if they are in some sense of chronic pain, let's just say greater than three months, let's say they don't have a level of education past the point of they're loading trucks, they're laborers, they're feeding their kids, they're doing what they can. They're looking, as you know, kind of two weeks, four weeks. They're not looking six months out. So the only comment I have is just, on the outcomes, one thing that has worked very well is that we're, we in the practice are actually looking at force generated in the biofeedback machine. All right. That's an objective measure. Good. And we're not uh, talking pain. And then I'm correlating that with the, with the width of the muscle, for example, the quadricep. And I'm showing it to that same patient on the screen. And then they say, damn, it works. And my sugars didn't go up. So there's a, you have to, I think you have to, they can't pay for it. They can't afford it. I'll give them, you know, what, what they can, maybe PRP, super, but at least I'm giving them options, and I think that yeah, okay. ultimately is Yeah, that's fine. I mean, this poor young fellow, he, all he wants is good options for his patients. Right. He, he cares, right? He's learned techniques. At this point, if I've learned, I spent a year learning techniques, you probably want to, Use them, right? I understand that, and there are probably people that come back that say, "Wow, that was incredible." I understand that, right? And those are the people you really need to try to figure out who are the ones where I can do this and I can get this fantastic thing, and then I can get them going and motivated to something that's more robust. Because for the most part, when you look at corticosteroid studies, they're like a sugar high. You get six weeks. That's what you get. So I tell everybody, it's like your kid is hungry and you keep feeding the kid Captain Crunch. You can't do that, right? So in a pinch, right, your kid's screaming, he's falling on the ground, he hasn't eaten. You, 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 you give him the Captain Crunch. You say, all right, right? But you're going to know that that's not enough. So you don't keep giving him Captain Crunch. After a while, you've got to say, i got to give this kid something that's going to be good for him, her, 
and something sustainable over time. That, yeah, that's my goal. Yeah. Is, you know, yeah. It's, see what happens. Yeah. See what happens. It's up to all of us to make this not treatments that's for people with a big wallet with cash that they want to drop down, but people that, uh, treatments that are robust for everyone. Because our healthcare system, the curve will bend like this if we do that, right? We're going the wrong way. Every, all the numbers are going the wrong way. Healthcare is in critical condition. It's 20% of our gross domestic product. 2% of our GDP is spent on orthopedic treatments. That's freaking crazy. That's, we gotta stop. If you had a patient who was, I mean, when would you refer? Like, I understand degenerative meniscus, you know, no surgery. But if they're coming with locking or yeah, buckling, okay. then is that something where you take a step back and consider surgical, or do you yeah. still consider more regenerative? So they try to, mechanical symptoms, right? That's what some buys people surgery. They try to quantify what are mechanical symptoms. No one can quantify that, right? So, and do you know the, the, the sham study actually showed that people that got the sham, the no study, had less mechanical symptoms. And people that got the surgery had more mechanical symptoms after than before the <coughs> surgery. So I'm not saying that you don't want to do something, but you certainly don't want to do something that's been shown to not work and cause more problems. You've got to say, okay, we've got to close the book on that. But if 30% of your income is based on doing that, if Morristown Memorial's outpatient hospital volume is 25% based on arthroscopic surgeries, if Depew, uh, Smith, and Arthro, uh, uh, Arthrex makes $10 billion from the equipment stands for arthroscopic surgery. Do you think that surgery is going to go away? <coughs> the, I mean, the, the market forces aren't moving in that direction. But for pe if we're interested in human beings and people, that stuff's got to go away. It's not going to be easy. Yeah. No. Now, I know they're doing, they're trying to do more meniscal repairs for some patients. Sure are. Resections? Like, who can get a meniscal repair? Who's a candidate for meniscal? Is Am I a candidate for meniscal? I tear my meniscus. Am I a candidate for meniscal sure. repair? Dr. Foy? Also depends on location. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where? Where, where is he? Yeah. So, <laughs> so all, all that to say is that of all meniscal tears, and let's talk about the adolescent athlete, right? I just saw a kid in college had a meniscal tear, he had a bucket handle tear, and 80% of his meniscus is taken out. Oh my gosh. That sucks. Wow. And he ain't a happy camper right now either. So in the NFL, that's what they do because they got to get back on the field. Those guys, are, those guys are hired cattle. They don't really care what happens to those guys next year, five years later, and then if they can't get out of bed. And you saw people that this year who were a little cerebral, mm -hmm. maybe had more money, anyhow, they didn't worry about it. You saw a guy, Andrew, Andrew Luck, a premier quarterback in the NFL, who couldn't take it anymore. He goes, I'm done. Pain, rehab, pain, rehab, pain, rehab. But, so if you can repair a, a meniscal tear in a young, young person, definitely should strive for it. Maybe 30% in the youth are repairable. The problem is that those repairs don't hold up. So about half will fail. And if you look at the literature to support meniscal treatments in the youth, it's based on like 80 patients. There's like, I was astounded. But I would tell you that enhancing a meniscal repair that has sutures with a biologic agent that can enhance the, what's happening there probably makes a ton of sense. So I think we need to not disparage orthopedic surgeon surgery totally we need to find a right spot for that right and then maybe find the overlap of the two um, and you know there are certain conditions where biologics have no place right so if my knee starts popping out sideways if I'm dislocating and that so biomechanical structural things need to be treated in an orthopedic structural manner pain, inflammation, maybe even some levels of instability, whatever that might be, probably needs thoughtful orthobiologic combined with 
there's a great role for hyaluronic acid. There's a great role for physical therapy, really good physical therapy. There's a role for some orthotics. There's a role for curcumin. There's a role for omega-3s. There's a role for acupuncture. There's a role for devices called pulse electromagnetic field therapy. There's a lot of stuff that we need to figure out and apply. And then I think we get good, better outcomes. Mm -hmm. Peter. So just one thing, you know, a lot of studies that you're talking about, right, the efficacy of like function and pain and things like that, but has there actually been any studies to actually show that there is a closure of a treatment gap? Like is, are people being delayed in their knee replacements or, um, you know, because you know, I think ultimately you need like a number needed to treat, right? So, you know, you need to have that number to identify like, is this actually a great substitute to prolong the knee replacement. So has anything been out there to show that like if I would get this treatment I'm prolonging my knee replacement by X amount of years? Um, so there is a great really interesting study by this guy Philippe Hernagou in France who uses bone marrow and he took um, these were hemophilia no I think they were end stage they were really young end stage knee arthritis. One group got a knee replacement the other group got stem cell therapies. Followed them over time. The stem cell therapies did dramatically better, had less complications. Um, the knee replacement group, two of them out of uh, like 15, had to get a revision surgery. So there is an inkling of that information, but we need more data to kind of look at, solve that question. Yep, answer that. Better. Yes? Given that this is not covered by insurance, because we all work in this insurance world that, yep. we, that was created before I was ever born. <laughs> so given that scenario, how do you have an insurance patient come in, propose something that's not covered, cannot be appealed, all, that's, all this great data which is more robust than the orthopedic literature from what you're presenting today, um, if that's not introduced into the horizon plans, into X, Y, and Z, then it's very difficult as a practitioner to implement what is here cerebrally when there's limitations in patients' deductibles and co-insurances. It's just really basic sex, Y, and Z Correct. financials. So, so, so what are most people's deductibles now? Twenty five hundred five thousand. Right. Yeah. Right. So what does a good PRP shot cost? Depends on whatever kid you yeah, buy. Well, right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So on the high side, nine fifty. Yeah. Nine fifty. So they could go along to, your obligation is to be aware of the literature. Your obligation is to keep following this. Your obligation is to try to restrain from using things that you know you really shouldn't be doing. And then your obligation is to inform the patient that there, are, there is this other area of medicine that's intriguing, that maybe it, it involves uh, out-of-pocket cost, but it may be the best way to spend your money mm -hmm. if you want. I'm only going to recommend it right. if it's going to work. The mm -hmm. best thing about me having to charge people cash is that I better deliver the goods. Because if I don't deliver the good, if you guys don't, if a surgeon does a treatment and it doesn't work, what does he do? Oh, send, sorry. Send, send it back. Send, 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 send it to rehab. Uh, That's right. what happens. Correct. Correct. Yeah. But there's no sense of obligation or feeling badly about it, really. No, just I like, that. yeah, that happens, you know? No, I guess Do you know that. how many patients that have knee replacement surgery still have knee pain after it? All the time. 30%. I would say higher. Yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah. you're... I, think, I actually... Okay, <laughs> correct. So why are we allowing that to happen? You can say the same with epidurals, too. I, I, I definitely will say the same uh, about epidurals. More. And I did something for spine unis on, on uh, radiofrequency ablation because the societies have wanted to water down the criteria for doing RFA, right? Because when I was a youngster, right, and when Bob Dunk would drive the societies, he would say, medial branch blocks, double, and, and when Paul Dreyfus did the best studies on RFA in chronic low back pain, he started with 400 patients, he ended up with 40. Those 40 did extraordinarily well. But the criteria for RFA was greater than 75, actually Bogdan and Lord and uh, those folks would say greater than 90% on a double block, on a double paradigm. So 75% I think is reasonable, right? But what's it down to now? 50%. 50%, that's like purgatory, that's like, that's not a number. And if you'd use sedation, people are half in the bag, hey, how you, 
oh yeah, it, it's a two now. So yeah, yeah, we need to be a little bit more thorough. I don't think we should be frying nerves, burning nerves, shoving stuff inside of people. I, I, I mean, I have done plenty of epidurals. I've done plenty of facet blocks. I've done, I've done all of it except for radio frequency, and there's still the value. Um, and there have been, when I select out well, really rewarding benefits. If you got a hot nerve from a disc herniation that hasn't responded, that person does well. That's about it. Spinal stenosis sucks. Why bother? Don't do it. Insurance covers it. It pays pretty well. That's why everybody's doing it. And That's the patient's the complaining. If I'm being optimistic. I don't do them, but I'm just saying the other... The other aspect would be that your patient's asking you to do something, which isn't a great criteria. But. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think it helps with diagnosis. Too, right? if, if you're trying to, if, if they're basically thinking in the back of their heads, not to go off on the spine thing, right? But they're saying, is this stenosis? Is it ridiculous? Is it combo? Sometimes I think the shots help almost diagnostically. You don't have Doubt to go steroid. Doubt it. Doubt it. History, physical examination, go from there. Right? They've done studies on stenosis as well. People with pinpoint stenosis uh, often have no symptoms at all. There's no correlation between the level of stenosis and the level of symptoms. The, the, the uh, MRI criteria uh, exist for the diagnosis of a sagittal volume for stenosis, and yet no radiologist will, will give you that, right? You'll read radiology report. If there is not foraminal narrowing at every level and, you know, blah, 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 based on what? If there isn't, I'm like, wow, this person, who is this radiologist? Radiologists are trained to find pathology, to set the patient up for some sort of intervention. So radiology is like taking a high-definition TV to my face uh -huh. and then asking somebody to interpret it. Holy crap, look uh, at that uh, guy's uh, face. Uh, uh. He's got crow's feet, he's got, he's got wrinkles, he's got, he's got, you know, all sorts of stuff. And then you create, like, really fancy words that scares the shit out of people, right? And then you, as a clinician, you go, and you go, and you put the MRI up on, or the surgeon does, puts it up. I am. That is the worst looking spine I've ever seen in my life. You have a spine of a 90 year old. You have a spine of a 90 year old. Bone bone. How, what kind of hormonal response do you think somebody has? What kind of endocrinologic response? What kind of internal response do you think that person has when you tell them that? Versus, take away their hope. You, you, have, you have a spine that's gotten older. This spine is no different if you took mm -hmm. 10 of your friends, right, who have no pain, they're doing everything, they're skiing, probably at least six of them over the age of 60 would have that same kind of spine or worse. Mm -hmm. So but that's, that's not really what your problem is. Your problem is that you've gotten deconditioned, your muscles have right. gotten tight. There's lots of things you can do. You can use natural anti-inflammatories, right? That person walks out of the room completely different. Words are really powerful as well. Mm -hmm. So get those books, right? Get Sarno's book. Get House of God. So who's read House of God? So what's rule number one? What's the most important thing that the fat guy teaches them? The goal in medicine. What's the goal in medicine? It's to do as little as do as little as possible. Do as little as possible. And so then the, the young intern goes, Yeah, but but, but when, when the attendees come in, they order all these tests and they do all these things. Why do they do that? And you know what his response is? For the complications. He goes, for the compl what do you mean for the complications? Because that generates more revenue for the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta read that book. It's, a, about the new book. it's a 40th, yeah, it's a 40th yeah. anniversary yeah. of that book. So that, The Citadel, is a really interesting book you should read. Uh, mind, mind over back pain, mm -hmm. sure. and uh, biology of belief. Read those, and you'll feel empowered, and you use those same concepts to empower your patient. Because what's been lost in our healthcare system is the fact that the human body is an incredible. Uh, incredible thing it has incredible healing capabilities our ability to self-heal are enormous if we facilitate it 
And we all know that on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, you, you cut your arm, right? It's not like you go, holy shit, I don't think that's... Our... And you go running, you know, just... You go, oh, yeah, okay. And, and like a week later, that thing is all done. It's all healed. What did you do? You didn't do anything. There was a, an injection. There was a medication. Your body found a way to heal it. And you know how it heals? Stem cells. That's it. Stem cells and platelets. So. All right. Thanks for indulging me. Thank you.